Follow on Instagram and Twitter at underscore underscore Beyond the Game and subscribe on YouTube at Beyond the Game with Ro and the Joe Bros. All right, guys, welcome man to Beyond the Game with Ro and the Joe Bros. We got a special guest for you guys today, Dusty May, the men's head basketball coach at Florida Atlantic University. Thank you, Coach, for joining us, and we really appreciate this time for you to come on the show with us. Hey, Ro, it's great to be on. Great, great. Coach, I know it's been a hectic whirlwind of a year for you guys. Just take me through how you guys feel heading into the season and just their approach. Um, you're the first FAU head coach, uh, men's basketball coach, to have a winning season his first three years. So how do you feel the momentum is building for something in the right direction? We feel like we've laid the foundation to, to take the next step. When we got the job, we didn't feel like there was a great respect for our program. And so in year one, we were determined to, more than anything else, just a garner respect of, of how we do things and being competitive every night. And now we feel like we've done that, so it's time to take the next step. This is our most talented roster, our deepest roster. And I think even as a new staff, we feel like we have a a great foundation laid and we like where we are on both sides of the basketball. So touching on that, who are some key uh, pieces and contributors that you think are really gonna make this roster be competitive? It starts with a local player, Mike Forrest. Uh, He joined us about two weeks after we got the job and had some ups and downs as a starting point guard as a freshman at a high level of, of Division One basketball. And we moved him off the ball as a sophomore, and he really flourished late as a sophomore in his junior year, shooting the basketball and being more of a primary scorer and a secondary ball handler. This year we'll move him onto the ball some, we'll move him off the ball. But he's got a great work ethic. He's a very talented player, and I'll be very surprised if he's not an all-league performer going into his fourth year of college. Yeah, Mike has been a key piece for you guys throughout the years. He's also a Broward County kid. How important is it for you to recruit locally, recruit South Florida, Palm Beach, and the Tri-County? Priority number one is getting the best players we could possibly get. Priority number two is getting local guys because we can outwork opponents. We can show them more love. And then with them being here, their families can see them play. Their friends can see them play. And it, and it brings more interest to the program and more fans to the program. It, it is important, though it's not the most important. But, yeah, it was a big sign getting Mike and then obviously Giancarlo Rosado out of Palm Beach. Those two have been two of the better local players. Your background, you graduated from Indiana. Um, you also spent time at Louisiana Tech and uh, University of Florida. How do you feel like spending all those years as an assistant coach really groomed you for the role? Being a, a head coach is, is, is a little bit like being a parent where you can prepare, but you're never really ready until you do it. And fortunately, we had a great staff and a hardworking team. So from day one, I wasn't overwhelmed with the responsibility, but I feel like I'm 100% better than I was last year. And last year, I was 100% better than I was the year before. So all those stops as an assistant gives you a chance to really formulate your opinion, your philosophies, and how you want to do things. And it just gives you more time uh, to think through what you want to do and what you want to be about as a program. And then once you get the job, then it, then uh, your personnel dictates certain decisions and where you are uh, dictates others. But yeah, we feel like it's went smooth for the last three years, but uh, we're eager and anxious to take the next step in Conference USA. Coach, getting back to your background, how was it being a student manager for Bob Knight in Indiana? I know you're from Indiana, but working for him as a student manager, how, how was that? I played one year Division two basketball, and I knew I wanted to be a coach. And I, at the time, I wanted to be a high school coach. It made sense for me to go back to IU as a manager because I felt like Coach Knight, with with his connections and what I would learn, I would be able to get a a varsity coaching job in my early to mid-20s. That was my goal. And after being there uh, one or two years, someone approached me and asked me if I wanted to coach in college. So it was never a dream, a goal. Um, I didn't even know it was a possibility of of someone with my background to coach in college basketball. So it it happened quickly, but it it was – Another former manager who's a, a Division One head coach said it best when he said, if you want to study business, you go to a Wharton uh, School of Business at Penn. If you want to study basketball, you go work for a, a Coach Knight or a Coach K um, or, or one of the legends of the game and just study and learn every day. We approached it like it was a three-credit-hour class. It was a much longer than a three-credit-hour class. But we approached it like a classroom, and we tried to learn and absorb and then, and then take the lessons and apply them where we coached AU or high school basketball on the side and just try to perfect our crafts and, and really work diligently over the years 
to try to become the best teacher and coach. So touching on that, being under Bobby Knight and being under Mike White, I'm wondering what's the best advice you've gotten from anybody in coaching, something that you carry with you today and something that a piece of advice that you would give to anybody entering the coaching profession. The biggest piece of advice, um, that's a great question. I, I can't, nothing jumps out as, as, as far as advice. I've gotten so many uh, pieces of wisdom or nuggets over the years, but at the end of the day, when you take the route that, that I took or that others take that aren't big time basketball players that aren't blessed with great DNA and, and all the gifts that the great players have, you have to sacrifice, you have to work, you have to be very competent in what you know and do. And then also it's a labor of love. You have to be prepared to serve 24 hours a day and be on the clock and, and, and ready uh, to, to tackle any obstacle. Cause when you get offered certain situations, a lot of times it's not an opportune time it's not convenient and you have to jump on it. For example, my first job, I was actually going to be a, a GA for John Calipari at Memphis his first year. And I got offered the opportunity to go back and be a GA for Coach Knight. And so I was in the process of going back to, to be the GA at Indiana. And I got offered a full-time position at USC. And the, the coach there then, Henry Bibby, who was uh, a legendary player, played for John Wood. Mm -hmm. I think he was 89-3 as a college player, has a couple of national championships, and then coached in the NBA in college. Coach all over the planet. And he said, how soon can you be back? And I was in California on a Wednesday, and I said, well, I land tomorrow at noon. I can be back on the road by 5. Packed up my stuff, left all my furniture, clothes, everything except what I could fit in my car, and drove to Phoenix 20 straight hours. or 24 straight hours, slept in Phoenix, and drove into L.A. the next morning. You have to be ready for any situation and I'm very appreciative of all the people that have given me an opportunity because it's a very demanding profession. Absolutely. Coaching requires a great support system. What would you say the role your wife played being the rock for your family and just being able to help you with your kids? If it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't be in coaching. My first couple of years, I made less than my rent and that's in addition to car payments and gas and all the, the, the food and everything that goes with just living. And she supported me for the first several years of coaching. So without her, I would have probably had to go back to high school or go do something else. Number one, first and foremost, I wouldn't even be in coaching if it wasn't for her. And then after that, she's the primary decision maker, primary uh, caregiver, everything in, in our life. I coach basketball and she runs and handles everything else in our life. So I give her all the credit for letting me do everything else. Cause, but then again, she gets to decide the houses, the cars, the schools, the, the everything else. And, and as long as I'm coaching, I don't really care. So it's a, it's a good give and take. You got three boys. I'm a young father. I have a near almost two year old. What has that been like to be a father? What's most uh, joyous about that? And what's most, uh, I guess, challenging? The most joyous part is just that, that I have boys that enjoy the game and enjoy my profession. So we can share the game. We can share our love of something. When they were young, they would come to the gym every day. After they got home from school, they would come. And even if they, they would just hang out while I was watching film or they would go on the court and shoot or hang out with the players. So they've grown up in the gyms. One of them, my oldest, is actually a, a walk-on player at Florida. My middle and younger sons play in high school. So even though they're not elite high school players or elite players, they love the game. They love being around it. And Today, my youngest son was in the gym shooting for a couple hours while I was in my office working. So it's nice to be able to share something with them and be around them and also be able to take them to NBA games and things like that. So it's a challenge, but fortunately, we've been able to merge the two of home life and basketball, and it's made my wife's job a little bit easier, too. I work for great bosses also that were very open to having kids around, and they felt like having the families was great for our players. That, that's probably been the biggest break in my career that I've worked for great human beings that, that enjoyed having young kids around because my boys were around all the time. But as far as a two-year-old, I, I would just try to get up and, and take care of all the morning duties, Ooh. the feeding, the clothing, getting them to uh, daycare and whatever else because I knew she had a long evenings ahead. Exactly. You want to just take as much off their plate as you can. That's, that's what I'm, I'm trying to do. But what an incredible opportunity for your kids to be able to be um, raised in, in this basketball environment, and you said that they, that they play now. When you do go to games, is that even more nerve-wracking than actually coaching? Because, you know, you really are not in control. You're watching <laughs> them play, and 
you can't really do much to help them. Now that I'm the head coach, I can set our schedule around okay. their schedules a little bit. And we practice in the afternoon. So usually in the evenings, I can break away uh, to go see their games or summer league games or fall league games or regular season games or whatnot. But it is nerve wracking. And I read uh, Mike Matheny's book. It's called The Matheny Manifest. And anyone that has children in any competitive sport, uh, I would highly recommend reading this book. And it just gives you a, a way of, of acting, a way of dealing with other parents. And, and just, especially me as being a coach, mm -hmm. I, I would think people expect my kids to be really good, even if they're not, just because they grew up in the gym and around the game. So not to add any extra pressure to their lives, to just be there to support them, to help them. And after the games, I may ask them, hey, do you want any, do you, would you like me to give you one or two pieces of advice? And, and usually they say, yeah. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I just say, hey, I enjoy watching you play. The only thing I care about is you being the best teammate you can be and play harder than anyone in the gym. Other than that, I don't care if you score a point, get a rebound, have an assist. I just want you to really enjoy what competitive athletics gives us and, and grow through it and not, and not have any extra pressure just because their dad happens to be a coach. Coach, I was going to ask you, when did you first develop uh, the love or the passion for the game of basketball? Very strange story, Joe. My mother and father were divorced when I was one or two. And when I was probably five or six, my mom took a job in another town and signed me for a youth basketball league. It was called Eastern Biddy Basketball, B-I-D-D-Y. Okay. And <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. it's ironic, but she says that immediately, the first week or so, she made me wear sweatpants because I was so aggressive. And I played so hard. Sounds like so me. Hard. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm sure I took out some ACLs at a young age, but I had to wear sweatpants. And from that day forward, I can't remember ever not watching the game, shooting outdoors. I actually inherited a college fund through the divorce, and my mother made one exception to my brother-in-law. We could actually pave a little area that our goal was under. That was the only exception. The rest went into a, a college fund uh, for our education, but the only exception was a $500 allotment on the side where we could pave our basketball court because we were always shooting in the mud in the dirt. Oh, man. But yeah, that just to show, that shows you how supportive my mother was, but also oh, yeah. uh, the, the love of the game where if you have anything, you could spend money on the planet. You had $500 back then, which is probably a couple thousand now. You'd say, well, I want to pave the yeah. basketball court. So That is true love of the game. So just being from Indiana, that's – a well-known basketball state. Who who did you admire growing up? I, I always watched the IU teams with Coach Knight, and that that's where I think I, I really um, developed my love of the team game and sharing the ball. And the summer are, are, are much better than the parks. After that, I love the Pacers. Reggie Miller is still my favorite player ever growing up. Okay. And then we actually subscribed to Sports Illustrated. We didn't have a lot of money, but we subscribed to Sports Illustrated, and it came with dazzling dunks and basketball bloopers. So I fell in love with Dominic know. Wilkins for whatever reason. So people assume being from a small town, Indiana, you love Larry Bird or you love Steve Alford or, or these guys. I love Dominique Wilkins. I love Reggie Miller. I just remember as a kid going out and, and imitating and use your imagination of playing and pretending you're all these players. And even I tell our guys now, I think that's one of the things that are lacking with the creativity in our game. They, our players don't ever go out and just imagine that they're so-and-so. They have to be worked out. They have to have a trainer. There's just not... There's not that a, a, a player, a ball, and a basket in your imagination. It's interesting that you bring that up. I, I, I had a question, like, what, are there any current players or current, like, teams that you look at and you're like, this program is really good? In terms of, like, the NBA, for example, is there any, I guess, program or team that you're like, oh, this is kind of what I would like. I know it's different. College and pro game is different, but in terms of the program, how how they run. I study the NBA game thoroughly and enjoy watching it. I, I usually just, I, I try to watch the teams that I, I just enjoy watching. And usually it, it's with ball movement and personnel. The Warriors, when they were at their peak, I loved watching them with uh, Draymond Green as the pastor and Clay and, and, and Steph running off screens. I enjoyed watching that because it was a little bit more like my roots of, of off ball screens and less ball screens. I'm a Pacer lover. I'm a homer. I'm from India, so I love the Colts. I love the Pacers. I always try to watch the Pacers. And then after that, it's this year I enjoyed watching the Bucks. I felt like they, they caught a lot of flack. And honestly, their coach, who wins 50, 60 games a year, they were talking about him being on the hot seat. So I'm always a little they bit. Were. Yeah. So anytime you're talking about these coaches getting fired after great seasons, I'm, I'm uh, very empathetic. So I pull for them as just coaches to stick it up everyone's uh, preferred behind. 
so this year I enjoyed watching the Bucks. I was actually able to take my middle son to the Bucks game in Atlanta, the Hawks Bucks game in Atlanta, That's awesome. Game Six, and, and found nice. a new appreciation for Drew Holiday. He's become one of my favorite players after watching. Him. I didn't I didn't realize what all he did to impact winning until oh, I sat close to the court and just saw him get loose balls and rebounds. And he's still like a freaking middle linebacker. He really is. He's an all around. He's an all around player yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, to be honest, I enjoyed watching them and the Hawks this year yeah. as two underdog teams. So I don't, really, other than the Pacers, I just I, I usually find a team that I enjoy watching that season and uh, kind of ride with them. Gotcha. Hey, I, I have to ask you. You mentioned the Colts. Uh, what are you guys going to do at quarterback now? Phil Berger says he's ready to get back out there, and you got uh, Nick Foles. There's some rumors about that. Well, Joe, because since I've been a head coach, I've been yeah. a bad, I've been a Colt, bad Colt fan. I'm too tight to pay for the NFL package, and they're never on down the road. They're on about once a year. Uh, so I, I don't know them near as well as I did. I grew up during the Reggie Wayne, Edger yeah. and Williams. You, Marvin Harris. Do you? Yeah, it's yeah, that's where I went. Yeah, I did that. Yeah. And, and yeah. I pull for the U a little bit, even though yeah. I love the Gators working there, but I pull for the U because Manny Diaz was – he was the D coordinator at La Tech when I was there. Oh, okay. And so yeah. his kids went to school with my boys. His wife was friends with my wife. So I pull for the U uh, just yeah. because of that more than anything else. But, yeah, Reggie Wayne and those guys, they're my favorite ever. That's I love awesome. It. I love it. What does Dusty May do when he gets any kind of downtime? Do you have anything that you have as a hobby? I know coaching is he just does so grueling. He does interviews That's with us. Yeah. I enjoy reading. You guys will laugh. I, I do all my own yard work because I can put on a, a podcast and, and turn the mower on and it just drowns out everything for a couple of hours. We, I don't we were just work. talking about that recently, Coach. We were like, a lot of people do that. They go about their everyday lives. They have a podcast in the background. It just... Yeah, and I, I'll be kind of a podcast mean. junkie, but the mower drowns yeah. out all the distractions and I can act like I don't hear or see anything else. And then and now my wife and I, we watch shows together. We try to watch a show a night just to spend some time together. She watches the HDTV and I like to read or watch films. So it's something that we can do together. And, and, and as you have kids and, and grow old, you, you don't have a lot of the same hobbies. But we've been, we've been watching an episode every night of Ted Lasso. So sitcoms like okay. that are shows online and we enjoy that. I heard that was really good. I don't really have any hobbies. Exercise, read, watch a show, and, and, and that's about it. But most of my time is consumed with, with trying to prove as a basketball coach. No, I hear that. I heard Ted Lasso was really good. I got to check that out, definitely. Yeah, we're getting towards the end of season one, and it, it's, a, there's a, it's a slow start. The first three or four mm -hmm. episodes are a little bit slow, laying the foundation, but it, now we're hooked, and, and we love the character so much now that it's, it's getting good. We all wanted to know, where did you get the name Dusty from? I, I just remember either my mom or dad wanted to name me Dusty and, and call me Dusty, and the other one said, we're going to call him Dusty. Let's just name him Dusty. I hated the name growing up until I got into yeah. coaching. And now it's it's a name that no one forgets. I'll meet someone. I'm 44 now. I've, I've met someone when I was 19, and they remember yeah. Dusty May. Uh, it's a very mm -hmm. easy name to remember. I actually had a friend in college that, that moved to L.A. shortly after I did, and he was a, an actor. He did mm -hmm. sitcoms, commercials, and his name was Rob, and they wanted to give him a, a, a TV name. And they said, you look like a Dusty. And he said, you know what, I have a Dusty <laughs> She said, that's perfect. Can you use it? <laughs> so I'd have to ask him for, for permission, but I don't really want to use his name. So, yeah, it's uh, it, 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 like I said, I, I hated it growing up, but I've, I've learned to love it now just because it's so easy to remember. And uh, it, it gives me something to differentiate myself from everyone else. Joanne, there, you had a theory, a lot, Joanne. There's a lot of uh, what you had a theory about why you thought he was named Dusty. Tell Dusty why you thought maybe he was named yeah, what Dusty. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. No, it wasn't really a, a theory. I don't think it was a theory. I just thought of the guy from ZZ Top that just passed away, uh, Dusty Hill. That's one of my favorite uh, rock bands of all time. And like, okay. yeah, but uh, no, I was going to touch on the fact that there's actually a lot of famous Dutsies that I know of. There was a uh, singer, I think back in the 60s, Dusty Springfield. There was the American Dusty Dream, Lens. Dusty Rhodes. Yep. Dusty Baker. Yeah, yeah, so like Dusty Baker. So yeah. like, there's a lot of famous people with the uh, name Dusty. The redheaded pitcher for the Dodgers. What's his name? <sighs> Is it Dustin May? The, the guy looks like Carrot Top. Oh, Carrot I know who you're talking about. I know who you're talking yeah. about. Shelby, yeah. you're the, you're the yeah. researcher. Shelby. Dusty Bottoms from uh, The Three Amigos. You guys are old okay. enough to. I'm dating okay. myself in the movie. I don't know. I didn't know Dusty Springfield, though. Uh, 
That, Are you guys the, know the movie Three Amigos with Chevy Chase and, and those guys? I know Chevy Chase. I love Chevy Chase, the vacation movies, but I never saw yeah. Three Amigos. Okay, you have to check. It's it's good. Good. It's on uh, AMC occasion. Yeah. We we should watch it. We should have a uh, Row in the Joe Bros movie night. There you go. You'll That's play it. me like Steve Martin, great comedians. And then I Martin Short was the third one. Another I'm sure. So, okay. I don't follow baseball too well, but it looks like there's a Dustin May who's a pitcher for the Dodgers. That could be it. Dust, Dustin, Dustin May? May. Dustin May, okay. Oh, right. like, like, Dusty May, Dustin yeah. May. There's another right. baseball. They call him Dusty, so I've gotten a few random texts from buddies in LA about that. Oh, boy. Yeah, I don't follow baseball. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Other than basketball, what other sports do you follow? To be honest, I, basketball religiously, I watch yearly games, mm. college games, the VA games, and then obviously high school. I grew up growing up. I loved baseball. I loved football. I loved all of them. But with a family and yeah. in my profession, I just drifted away from everything. The newspapers were the, the primary mm -hmm. source of of all things sport and, yeah. uh, and now it's like having a, an old 57 Chevy in your driveway. Yeah, we were touching on our last podcast about newspapers and the new age, new era, the TikTok, instantaneous era that we're living in right now. Everything's on Twitter. You know what I mean? I asked our players or my sons, hey, did you yeah. watch the game last night? Did you see that game? And they said, no, I just watched the highlights on Instagram. I just watched the highlights on Yeah, exactly. And now with yeah. NBA, they have the condensed games on there. You can watch a game and what, Joe? 20 minutes. It's, it's, they yeah. do, it's like 10, 12 minutes. minutes. It's, it's honestly, it actually yeah. does involve well, when you're just strapped for time and you're just trying to watch. Yeah. Like, it, it can watch like five games in, in the time it, for half a regular live broadcast. It's helpful. Well, we can purchase the fourth quarter. You yeah. can purchase the last that. five minutes of the game. You can purchase yeah. Exactly. You know, it's all for gambling. Gambling might actually save live sports. It keeps people watching. Yeah. Without the gambling, I'm not in the fantasy football. I'm not sure the viewership would be half of what it is. That's a very good point. Some NFL ticket, but a lot of people have it just because for the, the random fantasy players across the country that they don't yep. get it on their in their local market. So yeah, that's a very good point. Red zone. Red zone. That's Red all zone. for fantasy essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've never seen them watch a football game, but I know that they play fantasy football with all the friends. Fascinating to me. <laughs> like, What's something that people who only know you as a coach will be surprised to learn? Oh, man, I'm, I'm very predictable. There's not much. I don't have very many layers. I'm pretty much uh, what you, is what you get. I enjoy traveling. I'm, I'm very regimented in my day-to-day -day life routine with what I do. But I, I love traveling, seeing the world. We never really go anywhere twice. My wife and I, and the boys would travel every year to a different country. And now that they're older uh, and, and more independent, we travel with them every summer. We went to Greece the year before COVID. We actually went to Alaska in May as a family. So we try to take one big trip. I've crossed off 48 states now. I'm trying to get 50 before I'm 50. And I'm probably around 15 or 20 countries. After I hit 50, I'd like to try to hit 50 countries. But traveling is, is probably the, the neatest thing that I do outside of coaching. And is there any incredible. specific wow. place that, um, that stands it out really that you is. have uh, good memories? Greece is the only place I would say that I would go again. I would go again in, like now. Uh, we went to Crete. We went to Santorini. Uh, we did Athens. That, that's the only place. I love Jamaica. I'll, I'll go back to Jamaica. Coach, I'm Jamaican. There you okay. go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> big fan. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the yeah, even before we were in Florida, we anywhere we went, we're like, this kind of feels like Florida. This kind of feels yeah. like being in America. We felt like Jamaica was very authentic. The people were real. Yeah. And it didn't feel like you were in, in Jupiter, Florida. And that's probably our favorite Caribbean island other than maybe the British Virgin Islands or a few other places. But yeah, Jamaica and Greece are the, the two places that jump out as the most unique and, and the best culture. It's funny, the, the nice. Greece trip you just described, I just went on it two months ago for my honeymoon. It was Athens. Santorini, and we love, Crete was amazing. It's really funny, huh? Yeah, you just, where did you go in Crete? Huh? Where did you go in Crete, if you don't mind I asking? Don't, I have to ask my wife, okay. but she's downstairs, but. Okay, uh, but the food, the people, everything. It's yeah, amazing. it's, we went to, I don't remember, I remember Hanya, maybe? Hanya was one. It's a fairly big island, I didn't. Because we went, yeah, we went all over. The same place. It was pretty incredible. Crete, Santorini's fascinating too. I could, I could just walk around Santorini and, and, and just try to figure out what type of imagination would it take to create a place like mm -hmm. this. And so I came home and researched it. Actually, I was researching one night in a hotel just to think that those were once caves that evolved into... I almost fell over a couple of times trying to climb up all these steps to get to one of these caves. I almost fell a couple of times. Or I did fall. So uh, I'm very clumsy. I play basketball, <laughs> I'm but I'm clumsy. Here. I'm a shooter, barely, but that's about all I'm good for, so... Yeah. <laughs> It, 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 I'm it, 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 it
if you have any good travel spots, you have to send them over. <laughs> For sure. Um, Coach, I wanted to talk to you about NIL and how that's going to change things for you guys. How well positioned do you feel you guys are in the Boca Raton area in South Florida to really um, take advantage? I think there's a lot of opportunities for all of our players. But the thing that's probably lost in all of this is that it's hard to get true sponsorship endorsements and financial endorsements for the Miami, for the Marlins. College athletes can probably generate a little bit of trade and discounted prices, but it's very hard to generate revenue. The players that are going to gather the, the, the interest and the resources are going to be those that are in college towns like Alabama, and the, the companies aren't going to get the rate of return to justify what they're spending. It's going to be their spending to simply support having the best quarterback or the best football program. So I don't think it's going to have the impact nationally like people think. The impact that it's going to have, it's going to allow our players to, ha to have their own basketball camps, to host or to, to do one-on-one -on -one instruction. They've worked their whole lives to learn the game and be able to, to play the game and, and now teach the game. They should be able to get the going rate in Boca to work a player out or two players out or three players out. So I think there's a lot more opportunities in, in those areas than there are just the endorsements of a certain company paying our players to, to endorse their product. There are a few on our roster that have financial value because of their number of followers, but because they're on student visas and they're international students, they're not allowed to work on U.S. soil. So we've even inquired about, okay, what's the answer to this? Do they go home and tweet? Do they go take a vacation in Canada or Mexico? Do they charter, get on a charter fishing boat and go to international waters and tweet? So we've actually inquired about what's a way for these guys who have X number of followers to make the money that they could by simply tweeting to endorse a product or Instagram, Instagramming, I don't know the terminology, Instagramming to yeah. promote a product. So it's still fluid right now. I talked to 10 coaches on the road at, at Power 5 programs, and almost all of them said that the guys that are making the money are the ones that have TikTok followers and can really dance. Those are the ones that have uh, they're much more marketable than just the basketball. That's where we are. TikTok, TikTok. Yeah, there's the three most marketable athletes on our campus, according to the, the company we use. One of them is a football quarterback that hasn't thrown a pass yet, whose brother was a bachelor. Another is a uh, beach volleyball player, and then another one is a player uh, on our team uh, from Senegal. So right. all unique situations, but those are the ones that have the biggest following and, and could potentially make uh, money from tweets or, or Instagram. That is interesting. Yeah. So how motivating would you say it would be that you're at a program relatively new, trying to build a standard of excellence? How does that motivate you to eventually transform it into something that is somewhat of a mid-major power and something that has lasting power? Is that a driving goal for you? Absolutely. The thing that, that, that really fuels the motivation other than being internally motivated is the fact that there's so much room for growth at FAU. We're on the verge as a university, uh, as an athletic department, as a program of breaking through and being a major player at the mid-major level. And that's because of how fast the university is growing, the financial commitment to athletics from, from our president and athletic director. So there's so many things that, that, that are making this a great job in time where if you're at a lot of places at a similar level, you're trying to figure out a way to sustain where you are and just not drop. So it, it's just, a, it's a different situation being in South Florida, mm -hmm a growing area, a campus that's amazing, that is just new and people aren't familiar with. So if we can do our job of putting FAU's name out there, and you read on, on, on the, the ticker that FAU's doing great in multiple sports, and we're in the NCAA tournament, we're in bowl games, we're in the College World Series and, and all that, then, can, then it, it really helps the, the, the product to get the name FAU out there because there's so much to sell. We haven't brought in one single person to campus that wasn't blown away and said, wow, this is FAU because our, our campus looks like a five-star resort. Mm -hmm. Our buildings are all new. Our facilities are improving. So there's so much to be excited about, and that fuels my fire because I know how far we can go. We're not tapped out by any stretch of our imagination. What would you say would be so far the defining victory of your tenure at FAU so far? Would it be the Illinois game? Would it be anything else that stands out? Because uh, that game was was crazy. I was going crazy. I was listening to it on the radio. And like, <laughs> uh, Ken, 
Ken was doing Ken was describing it perfectly. I felt like I was there. Yeah. What game stands out to you the most so far? The UCF game because it was our first Division One game, and UCF was so good that year. It was the Taco Fall year, the the season they almost beat Duke to go to either yeah. the Sweet Sixteen or Elite Eight. So they had their best team in the history of their school. And we were able to go onto their floor, onto their court in year one and beat them. And then obviously the Illinois game. Anytime you beat a Power Five, and then the conference tournament wins. We, when we've been able to, two years ago, we played very well and beat Old Dominion the next day. The season ended because of COVID. And then this past season, we beat a very good UTEP team in round one and then had La Tech on the ropes beat until the last minute or two when we made a couple mistakes and missed free throws and whatnot. So just those games, just to see that we're. Uh, we're able to compete till the very end with the best teams in our league, and and we're getting better. So it it just shows where we can be. So I think those the the winning the games in postseason mm-hmm. and then sure. those big time wins are probably the defining wins in our program, especially last season when we had an abbreviated year. Joe is an FIU alum. How do you feel about the rivalry between FAU and FIU? It's actually become a great rivalry. And year one, I think it was our first year. Uh, was the first season of the pod play in Conference USA where we played them back-to-back in the same week. And we split that year, and there were articles in the Palm Beach paper, the Fort Lauderdale paper, the Miami paper. Both of us had our best crowds uh, probably ever in, in our home arenas. And both of us are in the process of trying to build a, 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 a top-shelf, a sustainable program. So the rivalry is in great shape. They, they, and then the, the next year they swept us. This past year, we swept them. We're very good friends with our staff. Coach Ballard is a phenomenal coach, great human being, and, and a very close coaching friend. So we pull for them when we're not playing against them. But uh, when we do play them, it's been great battles, and uh, we've both taken uh, shots from each other. But it's great for the game of basketball in South Florida when both teams can be competitive, the games can be entertaining, fans come in, because there has to be more of an emphasis at the grassroots through college level in South Florida. There's so many capable programs that we have to continue fighting day in, day out to grow the game and grow excitement for this beautiful sport. There's definitely, I mean, Florida and South Florida in particular is definitely a hotbed for football. But like you said, I do think there's definitely a lot of room for potential with the rise of basketball and like FIU and FAU growing the the sports some more um, in the state. Definitely for sure. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And then you factor in also that all, most of the universities in Florida are relatively new. We don't have the land grant universities in Oklahoma and, and the Midwest that have been around since the 1880s and 1890s. So our fan bases are newer, but population is moving here. People from Florida don't necessarily root for Florida State or Miami. Mm-hmm. They might have grown up in North Carolina or Ohio or Michigan, and they still root for Michigan or mm-hmm. Ohio State. So there's still a, a little bit of a lag time with the fan bases of the major schools and without a doubt with, with our the growth in, in student enrollment and as being a new school it, it's going to improve no joe M is a perfect example of that joe M, tell coach all of your um sports affiliate oh here we go what sport i'm not going to go through all of them what sport basketball go through basketball all right okay yeah for college basketball for me, obviously, I graduated at FIU. I got to go for them. But it is FSU uh, since I was a kid. Kentucky is where it gets a little weird. Kentucky. You mentioned Calipari earlier. Yeah. And the Maryland Terracons. So I'm like, I have one of the place with college basketball. And uh, NBA would be New York Knicks and Brooklyn Nets and the Miami. Okay. I like the Heat. The, your first two college teams I despise. So we, we definitely <laughs> We're going to have to exchange numbers and and go at each other during the season. There you go. Especially with the when I was growing up. The, the, yeah. the John Fox, Pat Ewing versus Reggie Miller. Those, those oh, guys. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. We were speaking about arenas. So you guys have a top-notch arena at FAU and all that. I would say, besides FAU, what's your favorite arena, favorite venue that you like to be in? In our league, Old Dominion has a great home court environment. They have a beautiful arena. That's a unique place. And then mm. uh, in the game, in the Odome in Gainesville is probably at the mm. high major level because of the student section, probably has the best home court environment. Kentucky's yeah. arena is huge, but it's, oh, it's yeah. a little bit of a, a, I don't want to say wine and cheese crowd, but it's not a, as intense as some of the other places. Yeah. Yeah, the, those would be it. Yeah. And, and yeah. obviously in the Midwest, yeah, growing up and, and going to the Big Ten games, they, there's a different 
uh, level of excitement for basketball there that, that hasn't moved its way down here yet, but it will in time. Yeah. It's kind of, that's how football is in the swamp or yeah. the place that, Flo- that Florida State plays in or used to play well in. I yep. love it. Oh, I <laughs> yeah, love it. Funny. I love it. Oh, boy. Yeah. You're, you're killing me. Oh. Okay. Thank no. you. I went through the years, so I don't like it. For yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Coach. Yeah. Yeah, you were mentioning if you were listening about uh, about Arena, like probably the loudest, most passionate fan would be Ashley Judd after all yeah. these years. She's <laughs> possibly, possibly. We actually found a way to win my last year as an assistant of Florida. We found a way to win up and we're up, and that's a very memorable experience to be able to walk out of that place with a, with a victory. Oh, that's I rare. bet. What's all so much what's history. All yeah, Coach, if I told you your younger self that this is what would become of your career? Would it be beyond your wildest dreams that you're a head coach of a Division One men's basketball? If you said I was a, an assistant coach of a Division One basketball team, I would have said it was beyond my wildest dreams. I thought I'd be in, in somewhere in Indiana coaching high school basketball, trying to impact uh, young players, young men, the way I was impacted by my coaches. And this is all just, a, it's still a, a dream that I have to pitch myself. It doesn't seem real. I still don't know how it's happened. I tell our guys anything's possible if I can be here with, with no connections, no affiliation. I wasn't a high-level basketball player. All I had was a, a strong uh, work ethic and, and a desire to improve and a love of the game. And, and somehow I ended up here. But also with that, there were a lot of people that really helped me along the way. And uh, that, that's what it's all about, is, 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 is really being uh, grateful for the people that helped you because our journeys are long and, and, and people have to, I've even called a couple of former mentors and said, why me? Why did you invest in me? Why did you give me the opportunity? Just as I'm getting older so I can pay it forward and try to help some younger guys out. I was just trying to see what they saw in me that I didn't see in myself. Yeah, without a doubt, this is all beyond my wildest dreams. It's a, it's a dream come true if I even had the dream. Coach, thank you so much. You've been incredibly gracious with your time, and we really enjoyed having you on, and we just wish you the best of luck uh, this season and going forward, Coach. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys having me on. You have my cell number. Shoot me a text. It. If you want to come to a game, uh, you got sweet tickets. We'll set you up with a oh, wow. with uh, appetizers, hors d'oeuvres, all of them. We'll, we'll do it big if you guys will come check us out. Oh, oh man. We appreciate oh, that. Amazing. Thank you so thank much. You, you. I'm actually up near Philly right now, but I'll definitely come down and play for that. For sure. Hands yeah. down. February. That's that's when everyone from the East yep. Coast is. No, I'm definitely looking to come down as a snowbird. Enjoy yeah. my uh, alumni team, FAU. Go yeah. out, throw it up. I'm Absolutely. with it. Go out. There it is. We, 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 I mean, we, would, we would love to have you on again, sure. too. It's definitely been a pleasure. We'll do it just before the NCAA tournament while we're on our way traveling to uh, whatever site we're going to. How about there you that? go. Oh, there you go. That, that's existence. amazing. Can't wait for that. Thank there you. you. So I appreciate you having me. But thank you so much. Thank you. Once thank again. you again. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Hopefully I'll be on again. That means we're in the tournament. Right. <laughs> I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Yeah, Let's see do you guys. It. Thank you. Appreciate All right, it. Take care. We hope you enjoyed the show. Remember to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore underscore beyond the game. Like and subscribe to our YouTube to stay up to date for future shows.